Now, uh, the question behind us is a question that I would like for us to try to answer. Uh, I, I don't want you to, to uh, this, this question came about because we know that last week we said uh, Stephen, first Christian martyr, gave his life for the cause of Christ. We know that the Apostle Paul, who's over in uh, the dungeon right now, is he's writing Second Timothy and he's preparing for death. And it's all because he continued to preach and to teach the word of God. So these are examples of people who gave their lives for the cause of Christ. My question to you is right behind us here. Uh, you can read it for yourself and you can just hold your hand up and tell me the, your answer. Uh, does anybody want to take that on? Is there anything important enough to you for you to give your life for it? For example, your family, your children, anything. Is there anything in your life, Sister Foster? Yes. <laughs> Christ was for me because we were all raised Baptists. Right. Uh, you know, grandfather, father, deacons and everything in the Baptist church. And when I really started paying attention, I found that this was mm, made a lot more common sense than the doctrine that I had been taught all my life. Right. And uh, so... Of course, uh, when I obeyed, once I obeyed and my family saw me coming, they just run in the opposite direction. Yeah, uh, see, so, a lot uh, of people act like they don't appreciate that. But when you choose Jesus, oftentimes it puts you in a dysfunctional relationship with your family. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you big enough to do that? Because a lot of us are faced with that. They, they, they just, you, you, you just won't do it. Because you say, uh, as they say, I, I, you know, they all know this. As far as I'm just going to say it, you know, Baptist born, Baptist dead. Mm -hmm. that's as, right. as, that's, oh, I, oh, see, see, now they're going to act like they know. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 come on, Sister Henry. Hmm. I, think that, I think that we do that daily. In, try, in coaching our family through whatever situation that they're in and giving them that Christ-like example or that Christ-like answer in terms of, so mentally, emotionally, definitely, spiritually, we give to Christ and, his, and our love for him daily in our situations with our job, with our family, and with strangers. Yes. But so it's not that, that is only accurate, sister, if you stand for those things, if, you know, if you stand just, for just like Brother Ricky was talking about this morning. There are times as Christians that we won't even pray for our food in front of our co-workers because you know what they're going to say? Oh, you all holy. And we don't want that conversation with them. So, you know what we say? I'm praying silently. I just thought I'd drop see, that. But see, my, my, my point of it all is that when, we, when we, we go to God on that person's behalf, we're giving our life, our time, and our attention to that co-worker, friend, family, for the cause of Christ. Yes. H however, one second, Brett, one second. In this particular case, we're talking about heads dropping off. See, they're going to cut Paul's head off. Yes. Mm -hmm. They killed Stephen. So, you know, I, 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 want to, I want to go with you when you say I'm willing to, to just tell some. But I'm asking, is there anything, anything? Now, Paul said, I am willing to die for the cause of Christ. I'm willing to die. Is there anything that is in your line here? that you would be willing to die from. Let me just tell you this real quickly. I had the minister here uh, this Wednesday and I asked him this question. He said, the list is real short. That's what he said, the list is real short. And, and, and my wife asked me the question about some of my relatives and I said, well, uh, okay, all right, come on, Rich. Yeah, I'm not. No, I'm not. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. You know, you just gave an example about uh, praying for all your 
And I remember several years ago, and I mean, not that we go out a lot to eat, because we don't. Right. But when we do, we always pray over our food. And I remember this, uh, this, this particular time, you know, we're praying over our food. There's a lady sitting over there, and she came up to her, she says, you know, I don't see that. She said, I really appreciate, you know, that you did that. I said, yeah, because I said, that's what you're required to do. Right. And that's she what said, we well, do. Thank you. And she just got, you know, she just got up and left, but it's just certain things that you do, and you're not, you're not ashamed of it. Not ashamed. Very good word. Sister Foster, one more. Come on. I think we live in a society where we have not had to die for our religion. I right. mean, it's getting to that point now, you would think. But we have had to maybe give up personal relationships, and I don't know how many of us would be willing to lay down our lives as they did in the first century in order to uh, be uh, to, to be a Christian. Because many times now, when COVID came out, what happened? Yeah. We submitted to the political realm of can't meet at the congregations, can't meet in the evenings, and all of those things. So, you know, maybe we need to take a second look inside because we really haven't been persecuted. That is my point. Okay, but let me add to your point. If you are not willing to do some of those things that you're talking about, if you get to the big one where somebody says, we literally are going to cut your head off tomorrow if you hold to this religious thing that you are doing, what's your answer? What's your answer? It's gonna, somebody going to say, I was just playing? Right, we're going we gonna to start, we're going to go to the lesson now. Is that, you know, because that's what, that's what some people are going to say. I was just playing. I, 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 no, don't, don't, don't nail me to that now. That's what we're talking about. Because some of us won't even stand against our families. And that is not even a death sentence. But what about if you really was facing death like Paul? You're going to see when we get to, to chapter 4, Paul said, I have finished my course. Because you know what he knew? They are going to kill me. That's what he knew. And, and he kept on going. Wasn't writing, he wasn't writing them saying, hey, hey, y'all come down here. Maybe we can talk this over. Right. No, he kept writing Timothy saying, if you choose to get on this road, realize they could kill you. That's, that's what he was saying. We, we're going to, uh, we have, uh, yes. I just wanted to say real quickly um, about praying, bef you know, while you're at work over your food. I've been at the same job for three years. And the first, of course, the first year and a half, I was the only one that prayed on my food every time we went to lunch. Now it's to the point where everybody is saying a prayer. So I feel that if you live, if we living, if, yeah live the example people will follow so this it may start with little things but those little things will come bigger things yeah that, um that. i also had to always correct them because they always wanted to say a cuss word with the word holy and i'm not for that yeah and i always used to have to stop and say hey we're not going there that's that's not holy so it's to the point now where the respect is there but they're watching the things they're saying and and I know that they watch me. Yes. And I, I know that we know that we have to live right for people to follow that example. Are you going to make a stand? That's what we're talking about. Yes, Sister Charlotte. I, when I first became a member of the Church of Christ, I had to grow. As I grew closer with God and this love and relationship with him, I became bolder and stronger and standing um, my grounds with people. And um, before I retired, <clears throat> they had to have been watching me because when I went in the lunchroom, I did say my prayer before I ate my lunch. But I noticed there were certain times when I walked in there, everybody kept quiet. Well, yeah, because <laughs> there were, that's right, you're being observed. But what I want to say as we dash into verse 13 is this. If you cannot take these preliminary steps that we're talking about, praying for your food, all of the other things, don't even think about somebody walking up to you with a sword in their hand. Everybody with me? 
Yeah, you say, I, I can't even stand up to my relatives and tell them I'm a member of the church. And if, so if you won't do those things, God forbid that somebody say, we're going to kill you in the morning. You say, I got a family. <laughs> Are you, you serious about killing me? Yeah, they, they're going to kill you because of what you believe. Let's do 13 here real quickly. Uh, can someone read 13? I got the King James Version, uh, 2 Timothy 1, the verses 13, um, and tell us. Uh, now, it's a number of words in there that we need to deal with. So someone read verse 13 for us, please. Yes. 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Yes. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, yes. Uh, now, in the King James Version, he uses the word blasphemer. Paul says that he was a persecutor. Is this the right verse? A persecutor. And he said he was injurious. What, what verse is that? It's 2 Timothy 1, 13. Uh, am, am I wrong? It was 1 Timothy? Let, let's, uh, let's talk about that real quickly. Can we? Because uh, we need to uh, put this in perspective here. Uh, Paul says that this is what he used to do. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. And he was injurious. That's injurious. That's First Timothy. Okay. So can can we do that really quickly to try to put this in perspective? I want you to see Paul, who he <clears throat> was. What does blasphemy mean? What he said he was a blasphemer. What does that mean? Right. Blasphemer is one, and that's what he said. Now Paul. Paul is just. He's not bragging. He is just telling you who he who he is. That's what he says. That that's what I did. And he said he was a persecutor. What what does that mean? What what, what does that mean? He made who trouble was, for the church. Who was he persecuting? He made trouble for the church. Yeah, he was persecuting the Christians. That's what he did when he was on this side of the line. He said I was a blasphemer. Uh, he said I was also a persecutor. He said he was injurious. Uh, injurious simply means that he arranged for the Christians to be hurt, killed. That's, that's what Paul did. So I want you to see him for who he was. That's what he said. I, that's who I was. And that's what I was really into. I was a blasphemer. Blasphemer simply means that's when you talk negatively about God, the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I did all of those things because you all were bringing out this religious pursuit that went against Judaism. So I was doing everything I could to stop it. That's what Paul said. He, he said, I, I was a persecutor, injurious. But he said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, the thing I want to say to you is that ignorance only lasts so long. You know, you can't just say, well, I've been exposed to this and exposed to it. And then your answer is always, I just don't know. Well, see, the Bible tells us very clearly that at one time God winked at ignorance, but he called, he, but he now he commands all men to repent. So it gets to a point where your ignorance is not going to save you. It's not going to save you. And that's what Paul said. He said that he obtained mercy because why? He said what I did was ignorantly in unbelief. So you can only go so far with that ignorance label. After a while, you are expected to come to Jesus throne. Everybody get me? You can't do it. You just can't do it. Paul had to repent. Paul had to take on a whole different view about how I am going to deal with the things as it relates to Jesus. 
He couldn't just keep on talking about I'm ignorant. I, I uh, arranged for these people to be dead, uh, be killed. I've arranged for these people to be run off and all of that kind of business. It, it's just not what God would have him to do. Uh, now, uh, let's see here. Um, we need to look at Second um, Timothy. Uh, I think. Let me let me take a quick peek here. Because we are in Second Timothy, I don't want to labor much in uh, First Timothy, even though it's a great book. But I want to labor more in Second Timothy. Uh, as I've told you before, remember this: that Second Timothy is the last book that Paul writes. That's the, that's it, and it is considered to be his last will and testament, because Paul is saying, "I'm getting ready to go. I have finished my course." He said, that's what I've done. And and I want you all to know that I don't I don't nowhere in here does Paul say I'm tired. But he does let them know I have finished my course. Now, you, I want you to just think about that for one moment. Will we be at that point when we get ready to get off this earth? Will we be at the point where we can say I have finished my course or will we be in a position where we'll say I'm still working? Everybody thought about that? Paul was able to say, I have finished my course. I finished my course. And that's where we ought to be striving to go. We ought to be striving to get to the point where we can say, I have finished my course. Um, now, let's let's look at. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, Verse 13 in Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter one, verse 13. Someone read that and let's see what, what he's saying here to us. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse 13. Someone read that. Yes, please. OK, Second uh, Timothy 1, 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, read 14 while you're there. <clears throat> that good things which were committed unto thee keep, unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Now, Paul is talking to whom now? Timothy. He's telling, he's, he's giving Timothy guidance. That's what he's doing. He's giving him guidance from his dungeon hole. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm giving you guidance from where I am. And verse 15, what does the Bible say there? This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me and whom are Phygelius and Her Hermogenius. Yes. 16, read 16. The, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiris. Honest, honest, right. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Keep going? Yes. But going. when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto us at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Yeah, now, see, this is Paul, and what he's doing is he is commending some of the people that he ran into on the way. He said, th th he, he talks to you about somebody refreshing him. You know, that is, g give me just a place to sit. Give me a place to gather myself, because I got one thing on my mind, and that is to try to spread the gospel, spread the gospel, give you an opportunity to be saved. And that's why we did the first part is because I want you to see that. Do you realize that when Paul really got started, that the other disciples were afraid of him? Yeah, they, they were afraid of him because why? You know how they say in the neighborhood sometimes I got a rep. Paul had a reputation that he would kill you, that he would have you killed. And so therefore, Paul is now on the other side. And the only way Paul got on the other side was because he had to turn away from those things that he did when he was on the Jewish side. You know, a lot of times people say, well, 
why is it that, no, if, if everything would have been all right, Paul would not have had to have flipped from the Jewish side to the Christian side. He had to get on the right side. And that's what we're talking about. Someone, uh, t let's go into chapter two here real quickly. Uh, someone read uh, three or four verses there and let's see what, what, we're, what we got. Yes, please. You really don't need a mic, but we're going to bring you one. <laughs> you don't need a mic? Okay, so on one sense, we know about Paul making a dramatic change. Right. As you say, completely changed to the other side. But there were things about him that he, what he was before stayed the same. In the sense, he was zealous. Yes. When he was on, let's say, the Jewish viewpoint and that Jesus was not the Messiah, he was zealous. Well, you I, know, And then he was zealous when he was on the other side. Yes. He also was well educated, and that education helped him when he sided with Christ because right. he used the scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Right. So his zealousness and his education was some part of him that was useful, let's say, regardless of what side he was on. Well, I, I, would, I would agree with you from this standpoint that one of Paul's greatest character traits was that he, once he got involved in a mission, he was all in. He was all in. It was, I ain't got time. Remember I told you earlier, Paul didn't have no wife. He didn't have no house to go back to, to make sure that the yard was straight. No, Paul was on the road doing one missionary journey after the other because he said, I am consumed with trying to get people to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, to obey this gospel. Because why? He had the history. What was the history? I used to be. I used to be. And that's one of the things that we need to do as Christians. Uh, don't continue to labor on what I used to be. We just give you a moment to digest that. You know, even though as a Christian, you're talking about don't, no, you don't know, whoo, you don't know me. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Everybody know what I'm talking about. Once you leave that, Paul said, it is gone. I am a new person now because why? I have repented of those things. And here's the thing I want you to see about that. He says, blasphemy usually is a death no. It's usually a death no. I mean, I can give you verses for what the Bible clearly tells us that you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Paul says that I was a blasphemer. That's what he said. He said I was injurious. He, he said all of those things. But Here's what Paul knew. He said, God gave me mercy. You know, sometimes we, we get real intellectual and we want to study things and say, well, the Bible says this about being a blasphemer. It says this. Paul just summed it up. He said, God can do what God wants to do. God gave me mercy. He allowed me to step out of that because I was a chosen vessel for him. And he was going to use me. Paul comes out of that. He immediately goes and he tries to deal with the Jews. The Jews didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with him and Barnabas. So what did Paul do? He went down to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles wanted to deal with him. And so Paul just started working year after year after year. And he said, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, you think about this. Now, see, you have to really think about this thing. Paul is high, mighty Jewish. High, mighty. Where is he? He's down with the Gentiles. See, that's enough to bring you to your senses right there. You say, I can remember when. When I was so important, I could just shake myself. And now, where am I? I'm down here with the Gentiles. They don't even have the law. They have nothing but their conscience when it comes to obeying the gospel. And now I got to start and I got to work with these people who really don't and are not accepted in no circles. Paul is down there. Because why? God is saying, I got to use you. I got to use you because why? You 
can help me to save these Gentiles. So that, that, that's right, and I appreciate that, Brother Jeff, to, to realize that. You gotta realize that. All of us have character traits. The question is, which of your character traits are you going to use, or trait, are you going to use for the cause of Christ? You know, you say, I'm an excellent writer, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. Are you using any of those things for the cause of Christ? That's what Paul did. He used every ounce that he had for the cause of Christ. Now, here it is. I already told you this, and I, I'm not ashamed of it. You got me in a hole and getting ready to kill me. I'm not writing Timothy nothing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sending no letters. I'm down in this hole. I can't hardly see. And you think that I'm going to be trying to write br brother, br my brother back here and tell him this is what you need to do. You need to do this to save yourself. No, I'm down there saying maybe I can talk to the warden. <laughs> OK, so y'all can sit up here and act like I know you got your holy wings on this morning, but you can just do what you want to do. But when it comes to us against them, me and I'm in a situation, usually we choose me. Yeah, am I right about it? We usually choose me. That's the way it is. And all I'm saying to you, Paul did not do that. He says, I'm going to write this young man and I'm going to give him guidance on what he is getting ready to face. And what's so beautiful about this is that Paul is basically saying to him, I'm laying out all of these things. And if you choose not to take these on. Then I'll understand. That's what Paul is saying. I'll understand if you choose not to take it on because this is dangerous work. They beat you. They misrepresent you. That's what Paul is saying. And that's what we need to know. That's why I asked you in the very beginning. Is there anything in your life that you believe that would be big enough, central enough for you to give your life for? You say, Brother Foster, when I get old, I might consider that real old. <laughs> See, that's, that's the way we are. You know, you say, I'm young now. I ain't thinking about giving my life for nothing. You know, I, you, you can ask husbands this. I ain't going to try to put you on the spot or nothing. Yeah, because she might be sitting right beside you. You say, you say, would you, would you consider, if it came down to it, giving your life for your wife? You know, when I was working up this question, my wife was behind the computer and she looked up at me just like this. <laughs> I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. Sometimes you sometimes you 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 there ain't nothing for you to say. <laughs> so I'm saying so, so you, you, you know, see, I'm just telling you right now, you're going to get the question before the day is gone. Yeah. If you if you got a spouse, you're going to get the question before the day is gone. And that is, baby, you know, Brother Foster went over that. Would you, would you, would you give your life for me? And you're going to have to say, <clears throat> Woo. you know, Brother Foster get up there and say a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know how I say it. They laughing now. See, sister, they laughing now. But you're not letting him off. I know y'all ain't going to let him off before it's over with. Let's read some of chapter 2 and see what he says here. What does he say in chapter 2? Read, read someone. What verse? Yes, chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. No, read three. Go, go ahead all the way to three. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Okay, now, now you notice that Paul uses that terminology of a good soldier. He said, because that, you're going to have to have that kind of regiment. You're going to have to have that kind of training of, of a soldier when you get into what we're talking about. But love that personal relationship that he uses with him. He says, my son. Now, we know Paul don't have no children, but Timothy is his son in the gospel. 
That's his son. And he says, he makes it very personal. Son, listen to these things. He says, you're going to have to be like a soldier. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So that's what he's saying. You ought to be able to teach what you know about the gospel. It's too late for you to not be able to tell somebody else about the gospel. You say, well, Brother Foss, I don't know all them verses. I don't know how this fits together. You know what you can always do? Tell them what you did to obey the gospel. You can just do that. You can say, this is what I did to cause me to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just do that. And that's what Paul is talking about. Someone read uh, verse 4, 5, and 6 for us. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Yes, yes. What, 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 what does he mean there about entangling ourselves with the affairs of this life? What, what does that mean? What does that mean? Come on, someone. Tell me what that means. Entangle it yourself with the affairs of this life. Yes, my brother. So I, I would liken it to being deployed. You got a mission. So you don't have time to worry about what's going on back home right. or anything else. All you have time to worry about is what's going on right in front of you, and that's the mission. And so in, in Paul's case, that's, he didn't have time to worry about none of the other stuff like you were talking about. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have, he didn't have time to worry about any of the ancillary stuff. He had one singular focus, and that was on his mission to preach the gospel. Everybody hear that? That's an excellent answer. Because you see, one of the things that Satan always does, now remember this, Satan will fix it so that you won't have time for Jesus. You won't have time to read your Bible because Satan will fix it. Money is no issue to Satan. He says, if I can get you promoted, and I will, to this level, you won't have time for Wednesday. You won't have time for Sunday hardly. I'll have you on the plane flying somewhere. You see what I'm saying? He says, do not entangle yourself in situations like that. A Christian ought to always be thinking, if I take this situation, is it going to so saturate me that I will not be able to do the things that is the first priority in my life? You got me, Sister, Sister Foster? Yes. culture and our society today right well we live in a democratic society and we won't want to get all into this but we, we we live in a democratic society and there are certain things that we can do in a democratic society this is talking specifically about getting yourself entangled in things that will not let you worship will not let you worship. And all I'm saying, if you don't understand that, just keep living. There will be situations that will be presented to you that will throw you off the road. And it always has something to do with money. Money. It says we can move you to here. Uh, and you get there and ain't no way for you to worship. Because why? You are so entangled and so caught up. That's what the brother was saying earlier. He says, when you're mission driven, you got to stay on the mission. You ain't got time to, for all of these peripheral things. And if you get involved into all of those peripheral things, you have gotten off the mission. You've gotten off the mission. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to drive us off of the mission. Yes, my young sister. I think it's like the thorny soil um, in that parable. Cause like, if you idolize like the distractions of this life, like, right. and I guess prioritize those things, um, they'll choke out um, the gospel and Christianity. 
Yeah, I'm so happy you said that because you see, for our young people, I just mm -hmm. dropped this on passing, uh, like, like my young sister here. It's important for you all to know that God wants us to marry us. Okay, I'll just work on this for a moment. Uh, he wants us to marry us. You can get yourself into a situation where you get off in the school, you get off in situations, and you get yourself entangled with something that's going to pull you away from the Lord. You see what I'm saying? But he's so good looking, Brother Foster. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, no, I, I do this class on my own because I know this stuff and, I, and I'm telling you, I know what I'm saying. That's what Satan does. He will get you entangled into a situation where you will not be able to worship. You won't be able to do the things that you know that you are supposed to do because Satan has done just this, what we read, gotten you entangled in things of this life. And things of this life is not going to save you in the afterlife. You get me? That's what we're saying. So don't get all embroiled in stuff that has the entanglement written on it. That's why I'm saying be careful, be careful. God didn't just tell us things because he didn't have nothing else to say. He tells us very clearly that we ought to, uh, for young people, you ought to look for you somebody to marry that's in the Lord. That was free. Because you'll be back in later on after a while and you'll be saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You see what I'm saying? He says that to us. He tells us things that we need to be mindful of, not to get us detangled in, in, in all other kinds of stuff. And then he talks about uh, no man warreth that entangleth with the affairs of this life. Uh, it, can we read six and seven, maybe eight? Oh, we read six. Uh, let's read seven, eight, and nine. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Isn't that a nice way to say that? He said, consider, consider what I say. Paul, you're on the last round. And you are begging me to just consider what I say. Because you know what Paul could easily say? I've been there. I've done that. But consider what I'm telling you. Don't get yourself entangled. Get, keep your head focused on what we are supposed to be about. Stay focused. Stay focused. And that's what one of Satan's biggest motives that he uses against us. He gets us all over the place. We're not focused. We're not focused on what we're supposed to be doing. We're not focused. And that's what, what the, the uh, Timothy is uh, being told by Paul right now. Stay focused on what's important in this life. What's important? Because see, soon you'll be like me. You'll be unslipped on through all of the chapters and you'll be in the fourth quarter and you'll be saying, how did I get here so fast? Okay, all right, you're okay. I know you're young when you're just looking at me now, saying, boy, woo, you just keep living, and you'll be in the fourth quarter real soon. <laughs> That's right, you'll be in the fourth quarter, and you'll be saying, how'd I get it? Because why? Time is moving on. Paul is saying to you, I have finished my course, and I'm trying to tell you how to stay focused, and if you stay focused, you won't get entangled in all of this stuff. And remember, the Bible tells us, what doth the profit of man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You see, Brother Foster, I got Jaguars. I got all kinds of things. I got a ranch. I got a house in Florida. I got stuff. I got stuff. I got stuff. Well, the only way you can get all that stuff is you got to get entangled. You see what I'm saying? He said, don't get yourself entangled with that. And I know what we're saying, but it, wouldn't it be nice for me to have a little villa down on this island? And wouldn't it be nice for me to have a big boat and all of that? You got to get entangled to get all of that stuff. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Stay focused. 
Stay focused because you're going to have to teach people what God is all about. Let, let's read a couple of more verses here this morning. Uh, number uh, 11, I think it is, or is it 10? Yeah, start with 10 there. Please read. Yeah, let's see what uh, 10, 10. Is Yeah, therefore, read, read that. I, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation, that in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is the trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, we will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He, for he cannot disown himself. Yeah, uh, verse 11, what does he mean there? What does verse 11 mean? What is he saying to us in that verse? Yes. Mike is on his way. So it says, um, if we died with him, we will also live with him. So I think about dying of uh, one, the symbolism of baptism, where we go into the watery grave and die. Um, uh, but also, as you were talking about with entanglements, that we die to this world like we try to um, remember that while we're truly here, then we can be, if we uh, follow Christ and sacrifice, you know, our, we'll say the, the worldly things, then we can stay on the spiritual path, and therefore then we will live with Christ and live with God in eternal life afterward. Thank you. You see, what Paul is trying to tell us is what's important. You, you know, as a parent, you're constantly trying to tell your kids that as you raise them. What's important? What's important? You know, if you can keep them focused and get them to see what's important. That's what Paul is trying to tell Timothy now. What's important? Are you going to live with Christ on the other side? Because all this other stuff is not important. We make it important, but it's not really important. So that's what he's saying there, is that we shall also live with him if you understand what's important. You're not going to live with him if you get confused about what's important. That, that's what he's saying. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will he also will deny us. Isn't that amazing? See, we're going to be in those situations. And that's what I'm saying. We're going to be in those situations where you're going to have to belly up to the bar, where you're going to have to claim it. You're going to have to claim that Jesus is our savior. You're going to have to say it. You know, uh, sometimes people ask you what member uh, you seem to be religious. Well, where do you go to church? And we say, I, I just church. You see, we don't even want to claim that. We don't want to claim it. And that's what he's saying. Let's claim who we are if you're going to live with Jesus in, on the other side. That's all Jesus is saying to us. Don't deny me, Peter. Don't deny me. You know, Peter was talking all that stuff until the heat got on. See, the lady said, your speech betrayeth thee. You talk just like them. And then you know what Peter resorted to? <laughs> Didn't he? D Didn't he? Peter said, you, you got the wrong man because I'm going to cuss you out now. <laughs> I, I done told you I don't know him. So that's what he's saying. Let's not deny who we are as Christians. Let's not do that. We, it is important for us to make a stand for the Lord. And that's what 
Paul is trying to get Timothy ready to do. Uh, really quickly here, I want to refocus us really quick. I got about a minute. I just want you to know what Paul is doing. He's in the dungeon at this point, preparing for death. He's writing his son in the gospel, two sons in the gospel, Timothy and Titus. He's writing Timothy and saying, I'm going to hand you the baton. But these are the things that I want you to know that you're going to face as you get ready to make this run for Jesus. Because I'm getting ready to go. Paul was so strong about it. He says, I have committed all of the things that I've done against that day. You know what that means? Paul says, I did them. I believe Jesus is going to pay me at the day of judgment. What a way to go out of here. What a way that you could be able to lay down on take your last breath and say, I believe that Jesus is going to pay me. He's going to do what he said on the last day. That, that, that is so powerful, church. That is just so powerful that you say, gee, and, and think about it. Our Savior, he can't lie. He's never lost a patient. And he has told you, if you do what you are supposed to do, I will be standing there at that day to pay. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Well, that's what Paul is trying to get this young man ready for. He's trying to get him ready for the rigors that he's got to go through so that he can face these devils that he's got to face because they will whip you. 39 licks in a minute. So that's what we are. We're going to stop now unless someone has a question that we'll answer next week. Oh, uh, because we got to go. Here, let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this time together. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we continue to go through the book of Timothy, that we will be able to see what the apostle is trying to get us to see. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will increase our vigor on a daily basis. Help us to be able to stand when standing needs to be stood. Help us, Lord, to be strong. Help us to realize who we are as Christians. We're peculiar people. We're different, but we're your people. Help us, Lord, to continue to follow along so that one day we might be able to be saved. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m., and on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.